Simple and utilitarian in design, baskets made by the Shaker community have been long admired for their perfection. They were used by the Shakers to complete their work and to sell to outsiders creating income. Historians say the Shakers learned many basic basket designs from the Algonquin natives in colonial America. To make them more attractive to outsiders, they created new designs they called fancy baskets to sell in their stores in the late 1800s. The cathead basket was one of those fancy designs. The name comes from the distinctive pointed bottom corners that look similar to a cat's ears. Making a cat head basket can require both shaker perseverance and feline dexterity. Traditional cat head baskets are made using molds. This is a traditional wooden mold. To weave, you attach the woven base to the mold using push pins. Then you weave the basket based on the mold shape. This is a more modern mold made of plastic. You attach your base to this mold using washers and screws. Then you're on your way to weaving the basket in the mold shape. If you can't get a hold of these pricey molds, you can weave a cat head using other items which can act as molds. For example, this mold is actually a square bowl. I used it to make this cat head basket. The weaving is attached to this mold using rubber bands. In this video, we are going to demonstrate how to make a cat head basket without the use of a mold. In part one of this video, we will be weaving this simple single wall cat head basket. In part two, we'll use what we learned in part one to weave a simple double wall cat head. So let's get started. This video may be difficult for beginning weavers because it assumes a mastery of basic basket weaving techniques. If you are a beginner, watching this with an experienced weaver can help fill in the gaps. If you're taking a class or following a basket pattern, use the directions from the teacher or the basket designer. They generally have reasons for doing things a specific way. Not following their directions could affect the outcome of your basket. Here are some things we'll use to weave this basket. We'll use basic basket weaving tools like scissors, a measuring tape, various clips, water, a packing tool, an awl, and a fid. You'll also need 3 8 inch flat reed for the 14 spokes, each cut 20 inches, 3 16 flat oval reed for weavers and lashing, and half inch flat oval reed and number three seagrass for the rim. Mark the center of your spokes on the rough or bad side and weave them into a standard woven base measuring five by five as shown on this template. There are 14 spokes laid out in a seven by seven pattern with the bad side up. As you know, some reed is thicker than others. Use the wimpier or thinner reed spokes at the corners of the base. This will help in shaping your cat head ears. These clips hold everything in place on the template. The clips will help as we flip this whole thing over. Then we can remove the clips and the template. Next, Measure the base again and make sure it's still 5x5. Five five. To maintain that proportion as we bend the corner spokes to create the cat ears, let's clip the corners in place from the inside. These clips will remain in place through the first row or so of weaving. Next, we'll start shaping the corners. Pick up the two corner spokes and with the bad sides facing each other, clip them together about two inches above the corner. Do this on all four corners of the base. You'll notice when you apply pressure to the middle of the base, the corners rise. This is how you'll create the ears of the cat's head. 
as we weave, we'll want to fan out the spokes to create our basket's round shape. To help make that happen, we'll pick up the two spokes adjacent to the clipped corner spokes. Cross them on top of each other with the smooth or good side up and clip them under the corner spokes. Do this on all four corners. This helps begin that fan out process. With most baskets at this point, you would create a locking row and upset your spokes to begin weaving the sides of your basket. Weaving cat heads is done a bit differently in order to shape the head and ears. Since the base remains flat on the table for the first six rows, I found that it's not necessary to create the usual locking row to lock in the base. Some pattern makers may include a locking row. If you're following such a pattern or a class that does, follow their instructions. You'll notice the raised corners will give your base a bit of a bounce as you weave. That's good, but if that bugs you, you can put a spoke weight on it to hold it down. As we start weaving, we'll be going around the base and encouraging the spokes to fan out as we go. They won't fan out much as we do the first couple of rows, but keep working at them and they'll start to spread. This basket has a stop-start weaving pattern. You'll want to make your stop-start point on the flat side of the base along these center spokes. If you try to make your stop-start point on the corner, your weaver won't lay correctly and it will make shaping of the ears more difficult. You also want to make sure the weaver stays flexible. You'll be weaving a total of 24 rows of 3 16 flat oval. Remember, the first six rows are woven with the base flat on the table. To start the first row, orient your starting point so that the center vertical spoke is woven underneath the first horizontal spoke. Then weave a normal over-under weaving pattern to the corner, unclipping and reclipping the spokes on the corner as you weave. Keeping these spokes clipped on the corner ensures the weavers begin the rounded and ear shape of the basket. It's important to keep both pairs clipped together for the first rows of weaving around the base. Do this on all four corners, ending your weaver in the usual fashion. As the weaver turns the corner, you can begin to see the pointed ears developing. To start each new row, I like to rotate my base 90 degrees to the right, or clockwise, to start my next weaver. If you're weaving left-handed, you would rotate to the left, counterclockwise. This allows me to quickly lock in the ends of the previous row as I round that first corner. Repeat the process you use to weave around the base on row one. Remember to gently encourage your spokes to fan out as you weave. Continue row four as you did in the first three rows. The only difference here is you'll eliminate the outer clips, the ones holding the spokes adjacent to the corner spokes as you weave past them. So we'll weave to the corner and release the clothespin. Then we'll go around the corner spokes, but that clip will stay in place for the moment. You'll also notice the spokes are starting to fan out like we wanted. As you weave row five, continue around the base and as you pass the corner spokes, Eliminate those last corner clips. Row six will be the last row you weave before you upset the base. You'll weave just as you have been with no clips in the way. This row is where you'll begin to equalize the space between all the spokes. You're now ready to upset your basket. Make sure you keep your weaving damp and supple. As you pick up your weaving and turn it over, you'll begin to see the curve developing to the corners of the base. Next, you'll want to pack your weaving and adjust the spacing between your spokes. For this basket, I find my fingers make excellent spacers as I weave. When you get to the corners, Massage the weaving to make sure that those points remain sharp 
like cat's ears. We need to watch those corners as we weave up the side. After the adjustments are complete, you'll weave row 7. Use a clip if you need to, to hold things in place. This row and the next two will begin to lock your base and spokes into place. The main focus will be to evenly space the spokes. Once row 9 is finished, we'll need to stop and do two things. First, make sure all the rows are well packed and the corners are well defined. All of this is to help shape the basket as we weave toward the rim. Keeping the spokes evenly spaced helps make that transition smoother. Here's how that happens. As you weave the basket, the spokes will come up and angle inward just a bit. That's by design. It gives the basket the rounded side, just like a cat's head, leading up to its pointed ears. Don't worry if the weaving on the sides of the basket is a bit higher than the corners. The rows will level out as we weave up the sides. The second thing we're going to do is help form the spokes into that inward curved shape. Sometimes spokes will continue to try to bend outward, and this will help fix that. We begin by wetting our spokes really well so that they'll dry into that rounded shape. Next, we'll take the six spokes on each corner and clip them together in four groups, creating the curved shape. This will leave the center spoke on each side still free. Those center spokes will be bent over to the center and clipped together. After that, let's set the basket aside to dry. I normally let it dry overnight. But if you don't want to wait, a hair dryer will speed up the process. Once the spokes are dry, the clips can be removed. With the spokes now taking the shape we want, we can continue weaving. Let's moisten them a bit and continue weaving rows 10 through 16. Remember to maintain the spacing between the spokes as you weave. Once row 16 is complete, it's time to do a little more maintenance on your work. The top of your row on the sides should be level with the corners at this point. If not, now is the time to do a little packing to get everything squared away. Your basket should look like this when you're finished. You'll also want to double check your spokes to make sure they are evenly spaced and straight up and down. I'm using my fingers to check that spacing. We've been angling out a bit from the base with our rows so far. The next three rows, 17 through 19, will go straight up. These will be the outer limits of our bowed cat's head before we begin the inward curve to the rim. When you get to row 20, you can see that distinct bow in the side of the basket. We are about to begin the inward bend by angling the spokes toward the center of the basket. After we dampen our spokes a bit, we can begin weaving, giving our spokes a gentle nudge inward as we weave. We'll do this on rows 20 through 24. Your basket should be about four and a half inches tall as you finish the last row of weaving. It'll have a nice rounded shape you've been working hard to accomplish. Row 25 will be your rim row. We'll use 3 8 inch flat reed, usually the same color as your weavers, to weave this row. Once the rim row is in place, we'll need to spray the spokes again because we are getting ready to cut and tuck them over the rim row. Cut and tuck your spokes in the usual fashion with the outer spokes folded and tucked a couple of rows down inside the basket. The inner spokes are cut flush with the rim row. We're using one half inch flat oval for both the inner and outer rim. Number three seagrass will be our rim filler. We'll lash that in place using three sixteenths flat oval reed. This is your completed basket. But I want to have a nice deep curve here at the bottom to really make their design stand out. When you turn it over, you can see that the bottom has flattened out a bit, which makes the corners a little less pronounced. 
If we can arch the center a bit toward the inside of the basket, those curves between the cat's ears are accentuated a bit more. To make that happen, let's soak our reed again to make it supple. Then we'll grab something heavy, like my handy dual caddy, and place it in the center. See how the curves arch a bit more? If you want them a bit deeper, just add a spoke weight or two, and we'll let it dry overnight. When it's dry, we remove the weight, and we'll find it now has a nice deep curve between the corners. This is your completed basket. You can stain or embellish it in any way you wish. With the single wall cat head under your belt, if you're up to the challenge, continue to part two and weave this double wall cat head. After weaving the simple single wall cat head, the double wall is fairly simple. You'll weave the inner wall the same as the single wall cat head, except the good or the smooth side of the reed faces inside rather than the outside. That gives the inside of the basket a finished look. Then the inner wall acts as a mold to shape the outer wall. You'll need the same basket weaving tools we used to build the single wall cat head basket along with 3 8 inch flat dyed reed for the 14 inner wall spokes, 3 8 inch flat natural reed for the 14 outer wall spokes. All spokes are cut 20 inches long. 3 16 flat oval dyed reed for the inner wall, 3 16 flat oval natural reed for the outer wall weavers and lashing. Half inch flat oval natural reed and number five seagrass for the rims. Oh, and we'll need something like a plastic milk jug and some pipe cleaners or twist ties. I'll explain how we use those as we go along. Once you've completed your inner wall, we'll be ready to begin weaving the outer wall. We'll begin weaving the outer wall with everything upside down, but the spokes would obviously break if I tried to get them to support our work. So I'm going to use a makeshift pedestal tall enough to keep the spokes free from touching the tabletop. This container I use to store clips will fit the bill. Our first step is to attach our weaving to the inner wall. We'll do that with our first spoke running through the weaving of the inner wall. This doesn't happen without a few challenges we'll overcome with some simple ideas. Let's mark the center of the first spoke we'll use for the outer wall. That spoke will pass through the center intersection on the base of our inner wall. Our problem is getting the natural reed through that space without transferring the color of the dyed reed onto our natural reed or damaging it as it passes through the space. Our fix is courtesy of the milk jug. We've cut a couple of pieces of plastic, about twice the width of our reed, from the jug. We'll call these sliders and use them to protect our natural reed as it goes between the dyed reed. I've positioned the base so the center horizontal spoke runs under the center vertical spoke. Next, I'll insert both plastic sliders between the center vertical spoke and the center horizontal spoke. Now, we'll slide the natural spoke, good side up, between the sliders and into place easily preventing any damage to the reed as you center your new spoke on the inner wall's base. That connects the outer and inner walls. I mark the centers on the first horizontal and vertical spokes to allow proper alignment. I'll line up the rest of the spokes using the ends of these two so I don't have a bunch of extraneous marks on my reed. As you assemble the outer wall spokes, Align them with the inner wall spokes and make sure the good side of your reed is up. These spokes may want to shift throughout the weaving process. You can use a spoke weight as an extra set of hands to stabilize them. It's important to align your outer wall spokes to follow those of the inner wall.
Want your bases laid out to make sure the new basis spokes remain as stationary as possible. We'll secure them to the inner base using a twist tie, wax linen, or pipe cleaners, one in each corner. You'll probably need to take the basket off the pedestal to twist the pipe cleaners tightly into place. These will stay there while you are weaving the outer wall. That done, the basket goes back on the pedestal to continue weaving. We'll make the outer wall just like we made the inner wall. You'll weave the same number of rows on the inner and outer walls. Those inner wall spokes will be your guide to keep the weaving properly aligned. To help you do that as we get started, we'll clip the corner spokes together like we did before. These will only need to stay in place for about three rows. To ensure you're following the pattern of the inner wall, orient your starting point so that the center vertical spoke is woven underneath the first horizontal spoke. Then, weave a normal over-under weaving pattern to the corner, unclipping and reclipping the spokes on the corner as you weave. Then, just weave as you did in part one. As you go around on row three, we ditch the clips on the corner. Once row three is complete, you can abandon the pedestal if you want and weave just like you would any other basket. Remember to keep the outer spokes aligned with the ones of the inner wall. Also, because you have the inner wall to hide the starting tails, you can give yourself a little extra length behind your spokes if you want to start your rows. The extra length gives your weaving a bit more stability and it will go unseen in the hidey hole you have between the two walls. Packing can become a little more difficult because the reed can get hung up on the inner wall. That means it's important you pack as tight as you can as you go along. I stop and pack everything as tight as I can around row 11. If things won't pack down as tight as you want, let it dry a little and try packing everything again. Remember, everything needs to stay even with the inner wall. Once you have row 24 in place, all you should be able to see from the outside is the inner wall rim row. Now is also the time to make one last check to ensure your inner wall and outer wall spokes are aligned as perfectly as possible. If they're not aligned, you'll run into problems while lashing. Once you've completed the rim row, again, check to make sure everything is level and the spokes are aligned. Make sure the walls are close together without any large gaps between them. If needed, adjust the rim rows in order to get them snug together. I cut the ends of my rim rows so the ends butt each other. That also eliminates any extra thickness. Now comes the fun part. Instead of cutting and tucking, we're going to cut and fold our spokes. Because we have a space between the two walls, there's no tucking into our weaving rows required. And because we're working with an inner and outer wall, we're going to alternate our cuts and folds. For the spokes on the outside of our rim row of the outer wall, we will fold them over our rim row and tuck them between the two walls. We'll cut flush the spokes which are on the inside of the outer wall rim row. And for the spokes on the inside of the inner wall, we fold them over the rim row and tuck them between the two walls. Then cut flush the spokes that are on the outside of the inner wall rim row. In other words, all spokes on the inner and outer walls are either folded over their rim rows and tucked between the walls, or they are trimmed flush with their corresponding rim row. We'll still want a trim template to cut our spokes. Mine is about three quarters of an inch. Let's wet our weaving again to make the spokes more pliable. We'll work all the way around the basket. I use clips to hold everything together and aligned. You're now ready to apply the inner and outer rim using half inch flat oval reed. Before we do, let's get rid of the pipe cleaners. Their job is done. 
Since we're going to treat both walls as one wall, it's going to result in a thicker rim with a larger space between the inner and outer rim bands. That means the rim filler will need to be larger than normal to cover the two walls instead of one. I suggest using number five seagrass as a rim fill. When we have the lashing done, just like with the single wall, we can accentuate the cat's ears by letting something heavy sit on the bottom overnight. Because it is a thicker basket, it may take a little more weight than what you used on the single wall. When you finish the basket, you may notice another problem. No matter how hard you tried, some of your spokes may have shifted during the process, revealing themselves when you look to the inside of the basket. To fix the problem, you may need to dampen the spokes and adjust the reed a bit. Then clip them in the place while they dry to make them align properly and stay that way. Once dry, the spokes should maintain their alignment to each other. However, because not all reed is exactly the same, it's possible some of it will still look a bit off. It's just the nature of the beast. Like the single wall, its simple design gives you a blank slate to show your creativity. I like to stain my baskets using Danish oil medium walnut stain. Thank you for taking time to view this video. As always, if you have any questions or if you'd like a copy of the pattern and graphics, which includes all the information contained in this video, please send me an email at the address on the screen and I'll be glad to share them with you. And feel free to send me a picture of your handiwork. I enjoy seeing and learning from what others create. These videos are all about sharing and learning. Let's do it together. <laughs>